are we good to go? Sorry, I gotta wait for Owen. Yes, it's live. Good to go? All right. Okay, I wanna, it's 9.30. I wanna welcome everybody to our April 22nd GRCA board meeting. I will officially call the meeting to order and look for a certification of quorum. Uh, yes, Chair White, we have more than 50% of the members present. Perfect, thank you. Okay, I just have a couple of, of brief remarks. Um, you may or may not know yesterday, I believe the phase two regulations came out. So Samantha and staff will be working together to bring a report forward on that probably next meeting. So we'll be looking forward to more of that. Um, on April 13th, uh, Vice Chair Sue Foxen attended an award ceremony on behalf of the GRCA as Sustainable Waterloo was chosen as a recipient of the Sustainability Breakthrough Award for the Microforest Collaboration Project. This project was supported by the GRCA with staff time, trees, and a planting plan by the GRCA. Thank you, Sue, for accepting the award on our behalf. Now, and you Samantha's didn't put it on, holding the award up. You didn't put it on your mantle, is it? Where did you put the no, award? No, no, Samantha's holding it up. If you look at oh, Samantha. okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. Thank it's you. It's an indigenous painting. Very nice. Find a nice place to hang that. All right. Um, finally, uh, the GRCA will once again be hosting the end of season tree sale, which is being on hiatus due to the pandemic. The sale will be held on the second Friday in May, and further details can be found on the website. The species and price list will be posted two days prior to the sale. So that's good news there. All right, if there's nothing, I will move right on to the agenda. I have a motion that the agenda for, so we're, we're gonna do source protection first, obviously. And since I'm already halfway through it, I, my, I probably should announce it. Anyway, motion that the agenda for the source protection authority meeting be approved as circulated, moved by John, seconded by Bernie. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Any declaration of pecuniary interest on this one? Hearing and seeing none. Previous minutes motion that the minutes of the Source Protection Authority meeting of March 25th, 2022 be approved as circulated. Moved by Bruce Banbury, second by Bruce Whale, a double Bruce. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving right on to correspondence. Motion that correspondence from the Lake Erie Source Protection Committee regarding the 2021 Grand River Annual Progress Reports be received as information. Can I get a mover for that, please? Moved by Richard, seconded by Guy. Any comments? Any opposed? Oh, sorry, Bruce, go ahead. Whale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a, a quick question. Um, in in the the uh, communication, they their opening statement was that the plan was progressing well but remain short of target and achieving plans objectives. Is that COVID related? Is it uh, financially related? Or um, I mean, reading through the report, it looks like we're, we're pretty close on objectives and our numbers look good, but is it mainly to do with septic systems or, or why are they saying, they're saying we're not, or we're uh, short of target on achieving the plans objectives? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I think Martin Keller is on and available to answer that question. All right, Martin, I'll turn the floor over to you. There he is. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. And through you, Mr. Chair, um, yes, the majority of the, the, the reason for why we um, kind of adjusted the, the rating to calling it short on target rather than on target is COVID related. And specifically with regard to septic systems inspections and development of risk management plans, those require property um, inspections, they require uh, personal contact, and those activities, as we, as we know, uh, were obviously hampered over the last couple of years with public health restrictions, really, um, for municipalities not being able to, to do as much as, as they wanted to. Does that do it, Bruce? Okay. Yes, thanks very much for that, All right. that clarification. Okay, thank you. I have a mover and a seconder. Are there any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Going into reports 12.1, submission of the 2021 Grand River Annual Progress Report in supplemental form. Uh, note, okay, I'll just note, to reduce duplication appendices A, B, referenced in this report are included with the correspondence on pages six and 13 of this agenda package. I'm gonna read the motion is, 
that the Grand River Source Protection Authority is satisfied that the 2021 Grand River Annual Progress Report in supplemental form meets the requirements of S46 of the Clean Water Act 2006 and any director's instructions established under OREG 28707 S52. And that Lake Erie region staff be directed to submit the 2021 Grand River Annual Progress Report and supplemental form to the, the Director of Conservation and Source Protection Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, along with any Source Protection Committee comments in accordance with S46, the Clean Water Act 2006, and any Director's instructions established under O Reg 28707 S52. A little bit of legalese there. Can I get a mover for that, please? Moved by Jerry, seconded by Kathy. Comments or discussions? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Okay, we're down to adjournment. Thank you everyone for that meeting that is now officially adjourned and I will move. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, are you getting a mover and seconder for that? For, oh, for adjournment. I, yes. I always think I have that huge power to just make everybody. Moved by John, seconded by Joe. Any opposed to adjournment? That is carried, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move right on to the general membership meeting and call it to order and just certification of quorum. Yes, uh, Chair White, we have more than 50% of the members present. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, we're, we're gonna move a motion for the, for the agenda, but I'm just right off the top, just so we're aware. I know we've got the hunting report later and there's a couple of items in there. We may have a conflict. We may wanna separate a couple of items out. So. Be aware we can we can handle that when we get to the end of it. But um, I'm going to do a motion on the agenda itself first, and then we'll go into the conflict. So I have a motion that the agenda for the general membership meeting be approved as circulated. Moved by Brian, seconded by Sue. Any opposed? That is carried. Our declaration of pecuniary interest. Bernie. If I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, as I pointed out, uh, there's a conundrum for me and I thank Samantha and Karen for trying to jump in. The difficulty is I understand that the, uh, the right to, or, or the right to run the program has de been delegated to staff. So sorry, I Bertie, I, I'm, I'm just at this point asking if there's a conflict. We will get into that detail when we get there. Did you want to declare a conflict on Dunville at this point? Well, that's the problem. I don't know whether to, to or not because receive his information for something is, is not a directional. So that's the difficulty. I will declare a conflict of interest on any discussion with the Dunville Marsh as I have been given an exclusive benefit as a uh, uh, Dunville uh, Broad Creek Recreational Club, the hunt on that property. Okay, and, and, and that works. It's your right to declare a conflict. I mean, it's not for us to dictate whether you have one or not. Um, if you're comfortable putting in a conflict on that Dunville portion of this report. So what we're going to do when we get to the report is we will separate out the Dunville piece vote on it separately from the main report. So you'll be able to fully engage in all the conversations around everything else including your concerns about operation or all that stuff. I just want to upfront here in the agenda, get that conflict declared. So when we get to that report, we'll deal with Dunville separately. Thank you. As I right. say, it was a conundrum. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's what happens. Okay. Are there any other conflicts? Uh, seeing and hearing none. Uh, previous minutes motion that the minutes of the general membership meeting of March 25th, 2022 be approved as circulated moved by Richard, seconded by Joe. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving along to correspondence. We have three letters there. Uh, Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, uh, Pheasant Hunting Program, Ontario Anglers and Ministry of Environment. I have a motion and, um, okay, okay, let me read the motion and then we'll, that the correspondence from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks regarding Conservation Authorities Program and Service Inventory Workshop, and for Mario Conigaligi, Jim Baker, Joe, Tony Jackson, and the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters regarding the Pheasant Hunting Program, and from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation, and Parks regarding an agricultural sector uh, representative to be received as information. 
Now, I know there's going to be some broad discussions around the hunting, and we will deal with that when we get to the hunting report. At this point, I'm just trying to receive the, the correspondence. So if, if anybody has any other comments on the correspondence itself, um, uh, can I get a mover for those correspondence? Moved by Bernie, seconded by Les. Uh, Bruce Whale. Again, Mr. Chair, through you, um, the letter from the ministry regarding an agricultural representative appointment, was there, was there any solution to that? It sounded to me like it's still up in the air as far as GRCA is concerned, or where, how was it left with the ministry, or do staff have any idea of, of what they're thinking? I know it looks like they are suggesting they may appoint to some CA authorities that don't have very much agriculture representation, but others may not have an appointment. Is that the, the read that staff took on that letter? Uh, through you, Chair White, um, yes, I would say that at this point we know about as much as in the, is in this letter. So the minister has the right to appoint. Um, my impression from the letter is that they appreciated the additional context about how we operate as an organization and how we operate as a board and that we do have strong relationships with the agricultural community. So um, based on the letter, we are hopeful that they are going to con consider that context, whether in their decisions about whether they appoint or not. And, and I don't think we're alone in that. I think there's a bunch of folks who have approached the ministry. So at this point, it's uh, thanks for the letter. We're thinking about it. All right, anything further on the correspondence? I do have a mover and seconder, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay, any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Moving right on to reports, 12-1 strategic plan update. Samantha has a uh, presentation for us. Samantha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you. Um, so this report is in follow-up to the strategic um, plan update that we brought to the board back in January. And in that report, it recommended that um, the four um, strategic objectives that were initially in um, the strategic plan, so that was the protection of life, minimizing property damage from flooding and erosion, improving the health of the Grand River watershed, connecting people to the environment through outdoor experiences, and managing land holdings in a responsible and sustainable way, um, are still valid and reflective of operational circumstances um, moving forward. So you may recall that we had asked in January to get an extension to this uh, to the current strategic plan, um, but updating the key action items under the strategic priorities and also adding two new um, strategic priorities, which include the compliance and implementation of the amendments to the Conservation Authorities Act and the new regulations, and also enhancing Indigenous awareness and understanding and relationships. So, in the report, it sort of provides context to um, the significance of each of those two strategic priorities. Staff are looking today for input from the board in terms of some of the key action items that would help to deliver on that strategic priority. Um, you may recall that we've done a number of action items already, which are, are examples in terms of implementing the new regulations. So for example, some of the amendments to the governance of the board from the changes to the act have been implemented into our bylaws. Um, regulations, the new regulations, we've completed the transition plan and the inventory of programs and services. Some future um, key action items that we can also look at is of course, delivering on some of those regulatory deliverables, such as the various strategies that were identified in the mandatory regulation, but also completing the MOUs for the category two programs and services. Now, in terms of um, strategies regarding the um, negotiation and implementation of the MOUs, the Ad Hoc Committee on Governance has been instrumental in a number of ways in terms of developing the transition plan and the inventory of programs and services. And certainly we will be utilizing that committee um, to help with developing the strategies for the MOUs and negotiations. Um, I think some of the key things to remember, too, is that there's still amendments that were made to the Act that still haven't been enacted and will be enacted in the future, um, and that could result, on, result in um, various policies and guidelines also being needed to be developed. 
So I guess at this point, Mr. Chair, I'm just um, wondering if the board has any further suggestions that would assist management in terms of the implementation of the new amendments to the Conservation Authorities Act or the regulations. Okay. Um, any thoughts from the board I, uh, on staff's work on, on the new, new regulations, as she just asked? Um, I can't see everybody, so anybody's got any comments or questions, please just speak up. Bruce has his hand up, Chair. Okay, thank you. I can't see him. Uh, which, which Bruce, Bruce? Whale. Bruce Whale. Okay, go ahead, Bruce Whale. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm, uh, my picture's right above yours. I thought surely you could see that. But... I have a very special screen, Bruce, and you're okay. excluded from it. You're, you're becoming too selective. I'm probably on the screen that's all blanked out. <laughs> Just uh, a question or a suggestion, maybe, uh, as to how to incorporate more communication with in the Indigenous uh, people in the in the uh, watershed. And in dealing with a situation like we had last year at Laurel Creek, uh, has there ever been a, an advisory, an Indigenous advisory committee uh, put in place that we could go to, to talk about how they would suggest we deal with something like that? Or is it something that might work if uh, we're in that situation again? I'm just trying to find a way of including more uh, uh, conversation or discussion with the Indigenous groups without uh, going through the process of uh, having them actually representation on the board. But uh, just, just a, a question and maybe a suggestion. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So, so I'm thinking, Bruce, that, that it, it, point two of the new items we're adding to the strategic plan is just that. Okay. It, it's, it's trying to reach out to them. And so that's being That'll be part of the new strategic plan action plan is to do exactly what you're talking about. Okay, thank um, you. Uh, Dan, comments on the amendments and regulations? Uh, I just had a, uh, thanks Mr. Chair, <clears throat> Chris. Um, just a comment um, with, uh, just following up on Bruce. Um, my, just my opinion, I just wanna state it now. I don't think you should be um, enlarging it to other groups and so forth. We have the parameters where we follow to the Six Nations Elected Council. Mississaugas are the credit. Um, if you start enlarging it to other groups, then where does it end? Because then other splinter groups will keep coming and coming and coming. And trust me, from experience uh, here in Caledonia, I have a little something to say about that uh, with, with knowledge. So anyways, just a comment. No, I appreciate it, Dan, because this is a new road for us and we're going to be into a learning experience. And clearly we're going to be looking to guidance from the board and experience and, and the rest of it. We're, this is a kind of a new road for us. So there's a lot, lot to do, a lot to learn. Uh, is that all right, Sam? Or Actually, there's the next, this was just about the governance, the regulations. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm trying but, to. Yeah. yeah. So I, I probably the next slide, I'll kind of allude to some of those items that have been um, well, brought up. So, so let me close the last one off first. Can you go back one slide? So anything from anyone on amendments and regulations, any thoughts or ideas? Uh, Richard? Thank you. Just uh, are we going to have a process to communicate the changes to the public? Uh, yes, we are. Yes, we are. Thank you. All right. It, it, so if there's, I see, uh, all I can see is Bruce Well, but if there's nothing further on this slide, maybe we could move to the, the, the second item we're adding. Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, as many of the comments that have, have come up, this is a new one in terms of um, enhancing our Indigenous awareness and understanding. I think um, although we have a long history, particularly with Six Nations of the Grand River, um, I think we can improve in terms of our relations with um, the Mississaugas of the, the credit First Nation. Um, we have a lot of informal and formal relationships already with the elected band councils, um, whether that be through notification agreements or legislative requirements, but we also have a number of informal sort of arrangements or agreements or partnerships with the elected band council in terms of supporting some of their community programs um, and activities related to environmental stewardship. So we already have that relationship, but I think it's, it's important for us and especially um, with circumstances that happened this summer, um, that we strengthen those relationships with the elected band, band councils. 
I certainly think that one of the then things that was brought up quite a few times, and we've had a number of um, community members reach out to us, is about the way in which we acknowledge um, Indigenous nations, communities, and peoples. And I think similar to what Dan's comment was, we um, have engaged with Six Nations and we're looking and trying to engage with the Mississaugas as well um, through those partnerships to understand the best way to um, and in a respectful way, acknowledge those communities. So I think um, in terms of what our approach is right now is to certainly um, engage and strengthen those relationships and the partnerships that we have with the elected band councils and look to them too for direction in terms of how to acknowledge Indigenous nations and communities um, throughout the watershed. I think too, um, given all that has gone on in the last couple of years as well, there's certainly... Um, an opportunity for training for staff and the board as well to understand the significance of the relationship that Indigenous communities have um, as stewards of the watershed through land, water, and other resources. Um, so we're certainly thinking that that's a good opportunity there to um, uh, particularly highlight um, the Indigenous perspective and knowledge around water management. Um, I think that that would be um, key for staff um, to get a greater understanding of. So Mr. Chair, in terms of those examples of key action items, the next slide is to facilitate the discussion around enhancing our Indigenous awareness. Okay. Um, so are, are there, and I, I assume that this clearly is gonna be a work in progress because I think for some folks, this might be the first time they're thinking about it from a board perspective. So if there's some ideas today, uh, you know, we'll obviously have opportunities from other input later. So are there any thoughts? Uh, I think Bruce and, and Dan had a couple. Uh, Dan, do you have something else? Go ahead. Yeah, it's just uh, enhancing along this line um, with, uh, with the education and the understanding and just promoting continued discussion with, uh, with the Six Nations Elected Council and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, very important. Um, they are... Um, um, facilitators of those of the watershed. Let's be honest, from from way back when. Um, again, and and they just want engagement. And uh, the more education out there that's with the indigenous community and and the people, they want to be involved. And just making them more involved, having those conversations, just goes so much goes so far. And and I think it would be a great initiative by the GRCA to continue um, moving that in that direction. Thank you, Richard. sir. Richard, has a Richard, sure, thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I agree. We, I think the board and staff at GRC uh, could use education on Indigenous uh, populations and issues and concerns, because uh, we're we're hearing it here. The Six Nations and the Sagas are the colonial government's appointment and decision on what the government is. That's not necessarily, you know, that represents about 2% of their population, if that. So we want to make sure if we're going to have a discussion, we educate ourselves about how the government was made, how it is, what the positions are with Indigenous populations along the Grand River, and how we can work with them. They are, of course, the first uh, original ones to care for the, the earth. So they will be, they're, they're natural partners if we do it the right way. But if we do it the wrong way, we can be in very difficult states. I know the provincial government, and the federal government says you 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 meet with the Six Nations Council and the Mississaugas because that's who we, the colonial government, has decided who you speak to. But but that may not be who the people say we speak to. So we, we need to keep an open mind here. Thank you. All right. A anything further? Okay. Uh, Bruce Whale. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just, I guess, one more quick comment from my perspective, and I really appreciate the the input that those that are dealing with uh, the First Nations more more closely than what we probably are in our area. But could there be some sort of a formal update uh, or report to to the board when some of these conversations uh, take place, so that we know? what their input is. I, I know that uh, Samantha <clears throat> certainly has indicated that they do uh, keep in touch with them, but as a board, I don't 
I don't feel that I'm up to speed on what those discussions involve or what their ideas are that we should be considering as a board. So if maybe it's just a more formal process that uh, and communications with board members that would be more critical to me anyway. Thank you. Okay, Bruce, thanks for the, for the input. Um, I can't see anyone else. So uh, any overall questions on the, so the, go ahead, Sam. Sorry, I was just gonna mention that um, in terms of the overall process for the update, um, we came back with the January report to summarize the key action items of the previous four um, strategic plans to show the board how we met or in the process of meeting those action items. We, since that time, I have met with management committee and the supervisors of the GRCA, basically asking them the same questions that I'm asking the board to get input in terms of developing the key action items to deliver on the strategic priorities. So the next step would be, I'm consulting with Six Nations and hopefully with uh, the Mississaugas as well in terms of the strategic priority related to Indigenous awareness. I will come back to the board um, to show you the key strategic items or action items, sorry, for each of the strategic priorities in terms of the update to the existing four and the creation of the two new strategic priorities to get feedback as well from the board on that before we finalize the strategic plan. Okay, can you kill the slides? Um, Thank you. So any further, I'll, I'll put the motion on the floor and see if there's any further comments. Uh, motion that report number GM 04-2238-2019-2021 strategic plan update be received as information moved by Kathy, seconded by Brian. Any further thoughts or comments? It looks like there's some work here for staff and they'll bring back some updates for us. All right, any opposed? That is carried. Thank you, Sam, appreciate that, it's good stuff. Moving on to general insurance renewal motion that report number GM 04-2240, general insurance renewal 2022-2023 be received as information. Moved by John, seconded by Sue. Uh, any comments? Any opposed? Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, there are some questions. Okay, uh, I'm not sure who's first, so I'll just take it screen-wise. Bernie, go ahead. Thank you. I had several questions and comments on this issue. Uh, I'm wondering in terms of the dramatic crease, increase, what is our experiencing in experience rating? I know we should comment on it. What are we doing as a, an authority to mitigate these costs? Are the deductibles in range? Do we have any comment on where we're going in a joint and several liability with the deep pockets of the municipalities and authorities? Uh, and what are our options? I know we are into a, a group. Uh, do we get a, a benefit from being in, in this group or are we better to go our own? I know there's a number of questions there, but perhaps I can get some indication. Sure, uh, I'll, I can speak to those and if I miss any of the, the questions, please uh, follow up with me. So yes, this is a, you know, a significant increase and we certainly recognize that. Um, the GRCA participates on the Conservation Ontario Insurance Committee and, and so I'm the representative on that. So I am there for the discussions and we do review all the things that you asked about, the deductibles. We do look for opportunities to, um, to add or increase deductibles where appropriate to reduce the cost and you will see that there were um, some increased deductibles in this round for the renewal to try to mitigate some of those costs being put on the group. Um, certainly that the concept of social inflation and you know, that relates to that joint and several liability discussion, that is a significant thing for uh, probably everyone on this call. Uh, the GRC does have extensive risk management practices um, and we do have a lot of policies and programs in place to address risk and reduce our exposure. We enter into, um, when we enter into agreements, we get legal advice to protect the GRCA. And I, the reality is that the world is more litigious than it used to be. And even, even where you have a really great agreement 
in the GRCA, there's solid indemnification and the, the responsibility is on the third party, um, the GRCA still incurs costs through insurance to extricate ourselves or to defend ourselves. So we that there are still costs incurred legally. And sometimes there are even still settlement costs if it goes in the hands of the insurer at that point. So um, certainly that's across the uh, across all industries is my understanding is that is a problem, but certainly it is more common in the public sector where people perceive deep pockets. Did I answer your questions? Did I miss any? Thank you. Okay. Bernie's thumb is up. Sue? Um, this is across the sector. I, I'm on several other uh, committees outside of politics, and it's happening everywhere. Burning the pool is the best way to go, because this is a ramification running through the whole insurance base. And pools, the reason we got into pools first, as uh, the CAs, as well as um, Region of Waterloo, was it brought our insurance levels down like three quarters. So it, it would be way higher if we weren't in the pool. Insurance is um, it, it's a, a mess right now. And they're trying to play catch up because of what happened for the two years over COVID, as well as other uh, ramifications. So I think we're in a good situation. I just can't remember in the report how we were gonna cover the shortfall. Okay. So um, it, we will, uh, details of the, the sorry, it, it, we actually didn't speak to it specifically in the report, simply because we haven't received the final invoice. And when the invoice is received, then there's an allocation assessment that has to be completed. And so at that point, we will come back with a, a forecast adjustment and we believe that that will be ready by next month. Okay, thank you. And some places have had 60 and 70% insurance increases. So when, you, when I saw the 38%, I thought we were lucky. Thank you, Sue. John? Sorry, you're muted. I just want to re reiterate some of the things that Sue has said. Uh, I, too, uh, serve in a number of capacities that are uh, private sector, and the insurance rates have gone up considerably this year. They have at the town of Milton as well. Uh, and uh, there was a really interesting Bernie uh, uh, discussion a year ago uh, at AMO about this great presentation was given. Uh, the region of Waterloo was, was mentioned in terms of uh, its leadership in terms of handling this particular issue financially. Uh, and is it going to be one time? Uh, we really don't know. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's a crystal ball, quite frankly. Uh, so you could see something next year that doesn't look remarkably different than this, but you could see a, a totally different situation as well. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that what I'll do is I'll, I'll get a hold of that presentation a year ago. I still have it. I shared it with town staff. There are some recommendations with respect to how this can be uh, dealt with uh, for the long term, and I'll share that with uh, with staff at GRCA. And if any of the board members want to see it, they can forward it on. But uh, uh, this is uh, a new reality in insurance in Canada. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, John. Bernie. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm aware of the presentation. I'm aware of the premier indicated that it was on the agenda for joint and several liability that they're going to take a look at it. They waffled on it. And now they're speaking again of coming back to it. And I know with regard to the insurance increases, I know that our, our county went uh, over 20%. So I'm aware of those things. But I would think in terms of that presentation, if you could circulate it to members, that would be great. Okay, thank you, Bernie. Is there anything further? Sue, are you back up or is that an old hand? Sue, go ahead. I um, just wanted to say, we have to remember, this has nothing to do with joint and uh, civil liability. GRCAs don't fall under that. Our CAs don't fall under that. This is strictly insurance. Thank you, Sue. Are there, so do I have a mover and seconder? I'm sorry. Yes, you do, John. I should moved, write that down. Okay. John moved and Sue seconded. All right, thanks very much. Are there any further comments? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving on to cash and investment status motion that report number GM 04 
cash and investment status March 2022 be received as information. Moved by Joe, seconded by Richard. Uh, any comments? Any opposed? Carrie, thank you. Financial summary, that motion that the financial summary for the period ending March 31st, 2022 be approved. Moved by John, seconded by Richard. Um, comments? Questions? Okay. Any opposed? Carried. Development interference and with wetlands motion that report number GM 04 2235 development interference with wetlands and alterations to shorelines and watercourses regulation be received as information. Moved by Ernie, seconded by. Was that you, Helen? Thank you. Seconded by Helen. Um, comments, questions? Any opposed? That is carried. Okay, down to the, the hunting update. So we, we got a couple of things we got to walk through here. Um, Pam is going to give us a presentation first. We're just going to start with that. It's just an overall presentation. And then what I'm going to ask is, because I, I need to do this, ask the board's indulgence to separate out Dunville, if we could, right? Separate that particular item out and then, and, 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 We'll let Bernie step out, I think, and then we'll just vote on the Dunville piece. And then we'll come back and we'll have a broad discussion on the, the rest of the report. And I know there's some items in there that we may need to figure out as we go through this. So if everybody's comfortable with that, I'm going to ask Pam to give us the, uh, the show. All right, Pam, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, I will uh, discuss our hunting program review. So of the 48,000 acres of land owned by GRCA, over a third of that is designated for hunting purposes. And through the review, uh, the hunting properties were evaluated for an updated criteria and that criteria included ecological considerations. Next slide, please. We also addressed the conflicting uses, whether we aligned, expanded or eliminated a hunting area we had specific changes at four hunting sites and we looked at the other GRCA lands and then we did the reevaluation of the pheasant release program. Next slide. From the risk management perspective, and that's what we were doing the review through, uh, we wanted to eliminate the conflicting uses. And so an area of concern that was identified was that multiple activities were being permitted on a property at any given time. And so that meant that some signs, um, some properties had signage that permitted hunting, as well as hiking, walking, cross country skiing. Um, a related concern was that while hiking and cross country skiing were currently permitted uses, they didn't have a formal trail system on these miscellaneous hunting properties that was actively managed. So that's one of these things that we we're talking about of reducing our risk. To address these concerns, um, and to minimize our liability, we took two key approaches. And one was that hunting and recreational uses such as walking shouldn't be permitted at the same time, that a single use activity, and that's modeled, it's a popular strategy amongst um, mixed use properties and other conservation areas to help manage the customer experience. So only doing one activity on a land at one time, and that would maximize the safety and enjoyment for users. And that too, uh, when we had recreational uses such as walking or cross country skiing, whatever, they should be permitted only on formal trail managed systems. And that would help reduce the risks of inviting users to engage in that type of activity. Hunters are very aware of hazards in natural area. And we also cover that off on our liability forms when we permit a hunter to have um, access to the property. To implement these approaches, um, we um, did a June to August access through hiking and walking. And then from September to May, it's hunting access only. And this is on the miscellaneous properties we're talking about. Um, places like Wilson's Flat South and the Bond Tract, we were doing, they have a high recreational use. 
So the formal managed walking trails would be available from the June 1st to August 31st. And the rest of the year, the property would be via hunting permit. Some properties where trail use was minimal, um, then it would be hunting access only. And that would be all the other miscellaneous properties. And Conestogo Lake has followed that model for years. And then the third option is like Luther Marsh. So it has modified summer access and there's no hunting on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. So not only, um, so that is a different kind of option of how you would manage risk. Next slide. So this is a map of our miscellaneous hunting areas and to put it into perspective, the city of Cambridge is at the bottom, very bottom of the map. And we're highlighting and to talk about four properties more in depth. So at the top, you'll see number three. It's, um, yep, by the mouse, that's great. And this is the Keldon Cutting Track. It's part of the township of Southgate and it's north of Luther Marsh. Next to that is number 11, that's Baxendale property. And that's to the east of Luther on the Amaranth Luther town line. And the third property we're gonna talk about is Wilson's Flats. That's number 16 on the map. And it's in the township of Center Wellington. And you'll see that it's one of the two areas um, that we have available for hunting below um, Conestogo Lake or Bellwood. And the fourth property we're talking about is number 17. And that's the Bond Tract. It's near Cambridge. And it's in the township of Puslich. So next slide. So Keldon and Cutting Tracks and Baxendale East and West. Um, these two properties are areas where we're actually adding to the hunting, the available hunting lands. So the current properties um, that are on our maps and information are the ones highlighted in green. And the pieces that we're looking to add are the areas highlighted in purple. As part of our review, um, we noticed we had some conflicting use information based on feedback from staff who were on site that our mapping and our signage didn't match up. So for years, um, both of the two purple pieces were confused whether or not they were hunting areas or not. And so in the case of the Keldon track, the green piece on the right hand, or the left hand side, sorry, um, we looked at adding the cutting track to the hunting layer. It met all of the criteria that we established for hunting properties. So we are adding another 195 acres of available land to hunt. In the case of Baxendale East and West, so the green is the west side, the east property was also considered um, confused whether it was open to hunting or not. So we, um, it meets the criteria and it'll be adding another 100 acres to this, to this section for a total of 227 acres in that location. Next slide. Wilson's Flats, this is the property that's south of Alora. It's very popular. It offers um, wonderful um, walking trails and has exceptional um, opportunity for river-based waterfowl hunting. That's kind of unique. So in efforts to reduce our risk at this location and provide better experience for both users, we're delineating the property by dividing it into two specific parcels. Um, on the upstream side, that's the purple side, closest to Alora. There's a beautiful trail and that's managed through the Grand Valley Trail Association. It's great for that passive, um, easygoing trail use and access to this portion would be for walkers only. So we're removing that piece from the hunting program and it would be closed to hunting. The Grand Valley Trail um, Association was consulted and they were in support of this change to help reduce uh, conflict between groups. So we're looking at the south side, the area in green, and that piece would be available for walking only from that June to August, end of August time period. And then after that, from September until May, it would be close to walking use and available for uh, hunters to use. And the same principle of this arrangement we're following at Bontract, where the whole property would be open to users during 
the um, the summer for walking and hiking, and then it would be closed to all other users except those by permit from September until May. Uh, next slide, Bellwood Lake. So on this map, you can see the two red safety zones. The lower safety zone is actually inside of the active conservation area uh, where we would have day users and um, other activities like boating activities and things like that come out of the lower one. The upper red zone is the cottage lot program. Um, so we keep a safety zone around those cottage lots to make sure that no hunting activities uh, would happen there. So a couple revisions, um, the waterfowl hunting on the reservoir, and there's conflicting interests between boaters and hunters accessing the lake and having the same activity in the same spot. So each fall, boaters use the boat launch um, and to use the lake and the whole reservoir until the levels drop in say mid-October. And then the boat launch is closed or docks are pulled in. And at the same time, we were having hunters accessing the island. And you can see the island in the top um, left of the screen, yep, right there. And then the Nurse Bay area, which is the area between the two yellow spots, they would access those two sections for uh, limited waterfowl hunting. It was a bit challenging. The reservoir drops um, when the reservoir needs to. So it's not always a, a long-term hunt or enabled to be um, a viable hunt if the reservoir water levels are too low. So it can fluctuate at any time. Um, we did note that only two, 10 permits were sold for waterfowl in 2021. And this area only has a total of 24 hunting permits sold. So it's not a highly popular desirable area. So by removing that, it helps to control the um, risk that we face on the um, waterfowl on the lake. And we realigned the areas you, you'll see at the bottom in yellow. There's the two sections of area one, and then the two sections of area two that are archery only. And those are just um, a realignment to make sure that we still fit the criteria, the hunting criteria that we've established with respect to um, land size and our neighboring concerns. These Yellow sections have always been hunting areas. We're just relabeling them. Next slide, please. So Dunville Marsh, um, while it's not part of the hunting program administered by GRCA, a private club does hunt this property under agreement. Walking and cross-country skiing activities were permitted at the same time as hunting. And there are no formal walking trails that are managed for public use on this property. So similar to the approach taken for the GRCA's miscellaneous hunting properties, access to this property would be limited to hunting only. Access for other than hunting would be considered on a request basis. So um, that could go through the property department and have an approval permit for that. And I just wanted to note, because uh, conservation areas are near and dear to me, that the area on the left is Bing Island Conservation Area. And it's across the river from Dunville Marsh. And it has wonderful managed walking trails and great opportunities for outdoor recreation adjacent to the marsh. So we are maintaining areas for outdoor recreation right in the city of Dunville. Next slide, please. So Conestogo and Luther Marsh, this is about Luther Marsh. It's a map of the hunting area there. It's jointly managed with the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. And that's through a Luther Marsh steering committee and through a comprehensive management plan. This large hunting area is well known for its waterfowl hunting opportunities. Um, it's, it's exceptional hunting um, location, but due to the size of the property, and the need for both um, access for staff to do other work like managing beavers or road repairs and to provide time for the birds to rest, which makes a better quality hunt. Luther op operates that there's no gun hunting on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. And this strategy is effective for Luther because it is a gated managed property and it's also a staffed property. Whereas the other miscellaneous hunting properties benefit 
from the month to month style of closure. It's easier to enforce. It requires simple signage that our diverse population of users could understand easily. And staff do patrol the miscellaneous hunting areas as part of our permit enforcement, but they're not there every day, which they are in a case like Luther. Next slide, please. So Conestoga Lake, it has a long history of hunting and there are seven areas there that have been well-established places for hunting by permit only. There are no managed trails. There are no walkers or hikers or ATV use at any time on these areas. And it's been managed that way um, for a really long time. And this area is also managed by staff who are on site and regularly patrol for permit use. Both Luther and Conestogo have maximized risk reduction strategies for years, and there are no suggested changes to either program. Mm. At Luther Marsh, um, the GRCA decided in 2009 to discontinue the pheasant release program. As it was noted in the management area, had other opportunities for upland game bird hunting without releasing birds expressively for that purpose that the pheasants weren't a feasible program. And during the update to the area's management plan of 2009 to 2019, this decision was reinforced by both the MNRF staff and GRCA, as there was no uh, desire to reconsider reinstatement of a pheasant program at Luther. So in 2021, Conestogo followed the direction of Luther Marsh and no longer offered the pheasant release program as part of their hunting platform. Next slide, please. So this operation decision has opened up discussions with interested parties, hunting associations, other conservation authorities and board members. And it was a decision that wasn't made lightly. There were many things considered that led to the outcome of canceling the program. Staff could not meet the requirements of priorities that were set out for their positions and something had to change and choosing to eliminate a small portion of the program that was the most labor intensive was a good business solution. The passion of those involved in this niche program is evident, and that's why we are open to continue to examining the impacts of this decision and the conservation authority's role in providing stocked hunting opportunities. Does this align with the updated program and services guide of the Conservation Authorities Act? as a category three program that needs to be self-sufficient? How best to operate it? Is this something that would qualify for special levy support? Are there options to hosting the program that fit within the framework of other established programs that are currently run by GRCA? So option one was to change the currency, our conservation area operations and reinstate the program as it operated in the past. And that would involve finding new staff supports or reprioritizing staff work and allocating resources to be able to support that program. Option two, reinstating the program with the use of volunteers to run whole or part of the program cooperatively with GRCA staff. The obvious advantage to this would that be GRCA wouldn't be paying for the hands-on operation of the pheasant release. However, there are some several challenges with this, um, including <laughs> our volunteer program or management program is really intensive. And to manage the risks and reduce our liability, we treat volunteers as an extension of the organization and they deserve training and respect for their safety like our employees. Our health and safety program requires extensive training and equipment, including soft body armor, to work in and around the hunting program. And staff don't have the resources to train and equip volunteers to be working in the same or similar roles as staff. Labor relations need to be considered to ensure that there are no contraventions of our collective agreement with respect to duties. Risk management's an important consideration that would have liability and insurance implications. Looking at option three to designate a full program to a volunteer group via third party agreement. The same concerns as number um, from option two would still be relevant, but additionally, the third party would have to ha be a legal entity in which we could enter into an agreement and they would have um, to provide adequate insurance. 
Also the Conage, Conestogo Cottage Lots, the reservoir and conservation area, they all operate in the same geographical location. And the th third party's operation might not align with those existing programs. So we looked at impact of the current um, Conestogo hunting opportunities with another provider and saying like one permits pheasants and could GRCA permit deer or other um, opportunities on the same property. So that's a little, that'd be a little challenging. There is a fourth option and that's to operate the hunting program with the resources that are currently available and to offer the same hunting opportunities that we did in 2021. Hunting for deer, turkey, small game like rabbits and other fur bearing species. Operationally, it was identified that staff resources need to be focused on conservation authority priorities like water management, dam operations, conservation area operations at the park, camping, boating, day user experiences, the conservation areas team as a whole for program support in the holistic sense. We work together on many projects, property support, including the property management piece and cottage lots. And lastly, we looked at niche programs like the hunting program. And the way the program operated in 2021 did allow for staff to meet their priorities and to manage the changing patterns of visitors that we had coming in to the conservation area. And this is where staff ended up and decided to move forward and provide a program that was sustainable with the resources at hand. So again, we are open to direction on um, how to proceed and I'm interested to uh, hear the discussion. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. I'm talking to myself. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so first thing I want to do, if everybody's okay with this, is we do have Bernie's situation with Dunville. So I think it's just a simple item. We'll, we'll take care of it up front and then we can have a broader discussion on the other items. So is there anybody on the board opposed to us separating out the the, the Dunville um, Marsh section. Basically, Dunville Marsh under agreement to private club will only be available for hunting activities. No walking trails will be permitted year round. Access for other use will be considered on a request basis. We're gonna pull that out uh, and let Bernie, I'm sorry, Bernie's gonna declare conflict, I believe, which he has. So we're going to separate that item out by itself. And I don't know, Bernie, if you wanna leave the room or however you feel comfortable with with your declaration if you just want to not participate that works too so what i'm going to put so if the board is all right can i get a mover to separate that out the dunville portion richard seconded by ian any opposed that is separated out so now the question would be this is a, a receive for information report so the dunville thing that i just highlighted we are receiving for information can i get a mover for that moved by catherine seconded by ian any discussion any opposed? Sorry, go ahead, Bruce. Oh. Do you get paid by the hour, Bruce? I. Uh... <laughs> No, but I sure not, don't get paid as a computer technician either. I don't know why it disappeared and the button disappeared and it wouldn't work. Sorry about that. Just, a, a, I guess, a question as a follow-up. My, my understanding from the presentation, this is operated under agreement or a, a, a club operate this hunting program on an agreement with the conservation authorities. Are, are all the issues that you talked about with insurance and liability, are they covered off by the group that operate this, this uh, piece of property that we're talking about? Pam? Through, through you, Mr. Sorry. Chair. Uh, yes, they are. Okay. Is there, okay, is there anything further? So any opposed to receiving the Dunville portion for information? That is carried. Does that work for staff? Sure. Okay. So with Dunville now out of the room, welcome back, Bernie. 
Um, we'll move on to the rest of the body of the report. So I'm just going to, um, we've got a motion that the, the rest be received for information. So I'll open it up to discussion. Bernie, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for separating that. I would find myself in a untenable position if I voted for that because it would give me a benefit that others in our community would not enjoy. Uh, I do have concern with the discontinuation of the program, the pheasant program, and I'm looking uh, at that third option, which is to have somebody come in and it says uh, volunteers, I would suggest open volunteers to run that program. Now I know it was mentioned in the report when it says third party that there may have, indication is there may have been some problems in Norfolk and other places, but this would take staff out of the equation to the greater extent for the resources that they use and simply monitor. So I would see that as an option and I would be supporting that option. Okay, I, sorry, I, I see we've got some hands, but just so I'm clear here, um, back to staff, the, the, uh, how do we do this? So let's say the recommendation from staff is that we do not continue on with the program in any, can you tell me what the staff, rec can, of the four options, which one is staff picked? Just so we're clear here. Pam? Three, three okay. Mr. Chair. Um, staff um, are recommending that we discontinue the pheasant program. Okay. So the report itself says to discontinue the pheasant program. And what Bernie would be looking to do is amend it to pick option three. Okay. Just, we just got to walk through this slowly because there's a lot of stuff here. Okay. So that's on the table, Bernie. We've got that. Let's, um, can we look, there's a lot here in this report. Can I ask just to keep ourselves focused? That we, we deal with the pheasant program up front first and see where we're going to go with that because I don't want to be jumping all over the place. There's a lot in here, so I'm sorry, John. If if you had something else, can I ask those? If you if you've got a pheasant question, let's deal with that first. Is that what you have, John? Can I? Or if not, I'll get back to you. No, later, Joe. Pheasant. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No, I just uh, if Bernie's willing to make that uh, a motion. Um, I would be happy to second that motion as well. I, I read through this report several times now, and it's really difficult for me to find the rationale for for uh, not reinstating that uh, that program. Um, you know, I think it uh, it meets all the uh, evaluation criteria. We seems that we have a huge demand for that program. Um, it's going to alleviate some of the uh, pressure on some of the other programs in other areas of the the watershed. So I'm uh, fully supportive of uh, of the program and having it reinstated. And uh, if Bernie is making that uh, uh, recommendation or a, a motion, then I'd be happy to second it. Okay. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm not put, let's go around the room and then we'll see about putting motions on the floor, how we're going to deal with this technically. I want to make sure we get this right, but I hear what you guys are saying. Sue? Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, yeah, motion number, uh, uh, option number three, I can't see the downside of it. Uh, can staff tell me what downside they would see of it? Because basically we're asking a third party to run it, take on all the responsibility. So what's the downside? Is there a downside? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I can speak to some of the challenges with getting into a third party agreement. Um, specifically on pheasant hunting. The first, I think, is understanding that the, the group or the, the parties that are interested are going to have to become some kind of legal entity and have appropriate insurance in place is one part. The second part is that we still operate other hunting um, in that area as well. So to, typically with those types of agreements and particularly with the significant liability that's attached with hunting, um, you generally grant exclusive use of the lands to sort of balance that liability perspective. So depending on which way we go with potentially with an agreement, we need, if we gave them exclusive use, that would mean all the other hunting would not be able to happen in that area. And it is quite an active hunting area in its totality. 
Um, the other side of it too is that staff would still have to manage um, probably from a perspective of enforcement um, elements with the agreement too, in terms of ensuring that they're adhering to proper safety standards and that sort of thing to operate the program as well, which I think um, Pam alluded to previously. And finally, I think it's 45 permits that are typically issued for this program. Um, and I guess the, the challenge is just the number of people that would be interested in terms of this and the cost associated with um, implementing a program, sorry, an agreement. So it's not that it's impossible, but there are a number of challenges still operationally from our perspective. Did, did you want to say something, Pam? Go ahead. Yes, thanks. I was trying to find my hand. I just wanted to clarify it's 125 permits okay. that are sold for pheasants each, each year in the past. So it's 125 people and we would stock anywhere from 1,400 to 1,600 birds. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, going around the pheasant room, Kevin, did you have a pheasant question or a comment? Well, I've got questions, uh, if you don't mind. Sure, please. Uh, yeah, so this, so this is not a question of allowing pheasant hunting. It's more than that. It's a pheasant stocking and hunting program. Have I got that straight? Not and Karen, we, we also have to um, feed, feed the pheasants and transport them out to the site and release them. Okay. Do we do that anywhere else? Like do a stocking program for a recreational activity? Here's for you, Mr. Chair. We do stock um, trout in lakes. So it's brown trout and rainbow trout through um, MNRF. Right. And, but do we stock pheasants anywhere else no okay and what other hunting takes place on this property uh through you mr chair there's deer turkey uh small game like fur bearing animals like rabbits coyotes okay. and how many permits do we issue for the other types of hunting uh, 300 okay so 300 of the miscellaneous hunting and 125 pheasant, right? Correct. Okay. And if <clears throat> why is it that if you do stocking and you allow a third party to do that, why would you then not issue the other 300 permits? Why would they be excluded? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the stocking requires the... Um, you have to enter into that hunting property and to release the birds into that property. So there's times where there's also um, deer hunting, the seasons overlap and they would intermix and you could potentially have different types of users on the hunting different things on the same property. Okay. And my, my last question, is, is that done anywhere else? Like in, in the area, let's say a private club, they've got a property and they do a stocking, is it is available elsewhere in the region? <clears throat> through non-GRCA providers. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, not that I'm aware of inside of the watershed boundaries, but there are locations um, adjacent and close like Hullet Marsh, Norfolk County, uh, Tiny Marsh has it, Peely Island. There's a number of other pheasant programs throughout Southern Ontario. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, I see a lot of hands, but are there Bruce Whale pheasant discussion? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I, I'm not too sure about timing with not knowing for sure where categories of recreational use or, or uh, snowmobile clubs using trails and hunters using our property, whether we're going to be able to slot that into a category that is still going to be funded uh, provincially, or whether it's going to have to be uh, self-supporting. Uh, if we don't know that answer yet, is it uh, the right time to be really doing the final evaluation on, on the hunt? I'm, I'm a bit concerned of the ethics uh, when we run out of deer in our 
our conservation areas are we going to start stocking deer so they can people can go in and hunt uh, if as a from a farmer's perspective if this is the way we controlled uh, some of our livestock population which were raised domestically and then turned into the wild to uh, be hunted as a sport I, i'm not sure of the public ethics support for a program like that and i'm not I don't know if I have enough information yet to be able to make a, an intelligent decision. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a hunter. I, I do own a, a firearm, but that's for, for uses of, of nuisance animals. And I think we should be encouraging the public to um, not, not necessarily go in to hunt. We don't, they don't necessarily hunt to feed themselves. They hunt as a sport. So is that something that is under our mandate? Um, I know if, if the demand is there, I mean, the other thing I'm afraid of, if it's not allowed in conservation areas or people are not willing to drive into uh, provincially or federally owned lands further north, is it going to end up in farmer woodlots? And we once had pheasants in our woodlot that have all been, uh, have disappeared. I'm not sure it's from hunting or if it's from environment, but where are we going to push this problem if we don't come to some resolution or work with uh, anglers and hunters and try to resolve uh, some of this demand um, and and find find a solution for it somewhere? I'm just I'm struggling with with the whole program, but uh, that goes for hunting too. Other than controlling populations when they become uh, the numbers become too high, so. That, that's my concern with the pheasant hunt. Um, uh, I don't, I've never heard of any issues around Conestoga Lake with uh, property owners that have, have had issues with the hunters there. And I think it is isolated from walking trails, but, but is it the right time to really be making that final decision? Okay, thank you, Bruce. Bob? Thanks, can you hear me okay? Yep. So I won't be, supporting the motion. I, I don't, I see this as a means to reduce the cost of the pheasant hunt to the pheasant hunters. Um, and I don't think that we should be managing firearms on our property through volunteers. Um, I, I'm not a hunter either. However, um, I do see that it's popular, um, I might support a motion around option one if it was full cost recovery, but my preference would be to uh, um, support the staff recommendation. Thank you, sir. Um, so just, okay, we got a couple things, but I just want to make sure that everybody wants to speak at this point on this issue has done so. I see you. Are you Third, is your hand up or did you have another comment? Well, my hand is up to make a motion. Okay. Uh, sorry, there's already a motion on the floor. Oh, okay. So this is where I'm trying to get clarity here. So we, so the motion on the floor is, can I just reiterate what it is, please? It, it's just to receive the uh, program review as information excluding the Dunville Marsh information. Okay, so the motion's on the floor to receive the whole report. So what we would have to do here, and you can tell me if I'm going down the wrong road, it's, I'm not an expert by any means. Can we separate out the pheasant piece? Have them have this, this option three voted up or down? Uh, like we so did with board's approval? Uh, Chair White, uh, there are a couple of options. We could um, proceed with um, a vote on the motion as it is, and then there could be a separate, okay, separate motion made with respect because we're just receiving this as information. Right. Um, alternatively, an, um, we could vote on an amendment to the motion that we receive it as information, and that there's other direction to staff. Uh, but it's probably cleanest if we deal with the report as information, and then if there's a separate direction being given or the, for discussion, then that could be introduced after it. So what you're suggesting then is if we receive the whole report for information. Excluding Dunville Marsh, because we already dealt with right. that. 
excluding Dunville Marsh, we can pass that. And then Bernie can put a motion on the floor and have it seconded. And then we have a second discussion around the pheasant hunt, if that's so wished. Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Okay, so Bernie and Joe, does that work for you guys? We'll, we'll deal with the rest of the report. We're just receiving it for information as has been pointed out. This is not a, this is, a, you know, it's debate, it's a governance model thing. And this is an operations issue. And this is staff's operational rec, uh, for information. So we can get the pheasant thing separated out or we can deal with it after the main report. It doesn't mean, go ahead, Joe. So if, if, if we're uh, willing to accept the report for information, doesn't that sort of imply that we're willing to accept the uh, recommendation of, of the staff with no, regard to the pheasant hunt? Am I, I, don't, I don't believe so, because this is just telling, this is staff telling you what they're doing operationally. They're not actually asking for action. That doesn't mean we can't then action some items, but generally it's to say, you know, we had 10 snow plows out on the road yesterday, that's for your information. It's not calling for action. So if we receive the report in general, it's like moving an item and not voting for it. All I'm saying is that once we've done the main report, then we'll open the floor to a motion. And if you want to then bring a motion forward to look at option three, we'll put that before the board. That'll be an actionable item. If you're uncomfortable okay. with that, then you could just, uh, look, I can't tell you, you could just abstain from the report if you like. I, I, I we can make this more complicated than it needs to be. Bottom line is we're just trying to get approval for the rest as here's what we're doing. And then if there's something you want to change, we'll look for a motion after that. Is that, does anybody, Bruce, go ahead. See, I told you. Oh, there you I'm, I'm finally back. Uh, my, I got it to on mute. So just, my concern, the only concern is, will we have the option to make comments on the rest of the report? Totally. After it's on the table? No, no, okay. so, so, my so you can leave yourself off mute, Bruce, just don't breathe, okay? Um, so what we're gonna do, if everybody's comfortable with this, so we've dealt with Dunville, let's talk about the rest of the report and see if there's anything else in there that we wanna discuss. Then we're gonna receive that for information and then we're going to bring the pheasant thing back if you, you so desire to bring a motion for it. Anybody object to that? Staff okay with that? Thumbs up. Look at us go. Okay. So let's go back to the broader report. John, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I had a, uh, an individual who lives near the bond track call me yesterday expressing concern about uh, what is proposed uh, at the bond track. And uh, I just want to confirm with staff, you know, have we had conversations with nearby residents uh, in all of these areas, or is that not part of, uh, of the process? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we did have um, communication with the neighbors where we were making an addition to the lands, so in the new, the north where there's the Kelding and Cutting Tracks and Baxendale Tracks, we were adding something. We didn't have conversation um, where the areas that we were modifying, because they were existing hunting properties, um, already having that use there, it wasn't a change on the site, it was just um, altering the times of things. So no, we didn't on Wilson's Flats or Bond. Okay, yeah, so, <sighs> Apparently, there's been some issue, uh, you know, ongoing for some period of time, and and uh, you know, the representative on the board who uh, who represents Push Lynch would know of this, and it's been ongoing for apparently 30 years. Uh, and my uh, counsel would be to, uh, unless there are other areas that are similar, perhaps have a discussion with with residents who are are nearby, because I know that. Uh, you know, in, in the report, it talks about, you know, the proximity of, of, of homes, and that's kind of one of the factors. And so, you know, on that basis, it would appear that there aren't homes that are within uh, a proximity of concern to, to GRCA staff when it comes to the bond track. Uh, and I don't know the area, so I don't know how close the homes are. So it might be a consideration, Mr. Chairman, to sort of uh, take a look at that particular matter, and, and, and perhaps there's others that the board uh, will raise today 
and just <clears throat> a little bit of a deeper dive uh, because the conflict, Pam, is uh, people will walk that track in the fall and now they can, they, they can no longer walk after August 31st uh, because it becomes a, a hunting area. And, you know, if there isn't another hunting area within, within a reasonable uh, uh, proximity, then perhaps there is no choice. But, you know, if there is, then maybe a consideration is to uh, uh, change the, the timeframes for, for hiking versus hunting in the bond track. Uh, but um, I, I leave it to you to sort of have that conversation. Uh, you know, operationally what you need to do, but uh, Mr. Chairman, this one was raised with me and perhaps we should take a look at it. Thank you. Okay, Pam, is that something you, can, something you can check into? You comfortable with that? Yep, sure. Okay. Through you, Mr. Chair, we um, we did take that into consideration, the property distance and did our mapping. And we also went through our enforcement files to see if we had any complaints from neighbors on properties with conflicting use. And Bond Track is actually, like I said, one of the two properties left under the Bellwood Conestogo kind of line um, in the northern part of the watershed. So it is kind of unique. And we do recognize that there are um, population pressures that may have future change, but it is kind of the only property left on its on anywhere below Bellwood Lake uh, for hunting. So thank you for that. We'll uh, take that into consideration. Okay, Jim. So um, I'm going to go to Joe. I see Joe and Bernie. Is it a general report discussion, Bernie? I'm not sure who was up first. I apologize. I'll go to Bernie, Joe, and then Bob. So Bernie, you have a, okay, go ahead. Yeah, general thing. Uh, you speak of ethics. I must indicate that uh, the hunting is a provincially established practice when, with regard to uh, animals and uh, the quarry, there's rules and regulations put out. So uh, those are regulated, the hunters are regulated. The hunters uh, in many cases have to have liability insurance. So I hope we're not getting into that um, discussion around ethics. It's permitted in Ontario. I see no reason why we can't have it on conservation authority and there are, are no conflicts between turkey hunters and deer hunters and rabbit hunters etc so i would have difficulty with saying that you can't can only hunt pheasants certain property thanks bernie bob thank you uh, so the general direction of the GRCA staff to mitigate the conflicts between walking recreational use on GRC lands and, and, and hunting, I think we are staying ahead of the problem a little bit by reducing the, uh, the coverage of the existing hunting areas around our uh, population center. We, we have a lot of pressure on um, the natural environment for walking at the moment. There's, there's all sorts of trail congestion in the cities and people are moving out of the cities in, into the immediate um, uh, rural neighborhoods. So um, I'm, I'm in favor of that general outlook. And I, although not specifically noted uh, in the report, I think that we're heading in the right direction. And um, those are my comments. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Um, so are there any further comments on, go ahead, Bruce Whale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have uh, agree with uh, the comments made by uh, John Challoner regarding the, the bond tract. And it seemed to me about four years ago, there was a presentation to the board asking for some restrictions to hunting in that area. And I can't remember the details, but um, I, I, I don't think hunting was eliminated, but I don't remember whether we restricted it, but to 
to only allow walking on trails that are maintained from the 1st of June to the end of August, I think is too short a period of time if people want to use that area for recreational walking and not conflict with hunting. So uh, I agree we, we should re revisit that and look at um, maybe some way that we can accommodate the concerns of the, the residents living in that area. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Bob? I'm sorry, there's residual hands here. Nothing from Bob. Bernie, you're okay till we finish the report? Okay. Is there any further, dis uh, sorry. Okay, so understanding that we're, pro go ahead, Richard. Just one, uh, th these services are services that uh, haven't been restricted or uh, the, to the new provincial regulation. These services are services that we continue to provide. I, I'm just asking that as a question. Sure. Sam, Karen, any yeah. reg stuff on this? Through you, Mr. Chair, a hunting program is a non-mandatory, so it would fall under the category three programs and services. All right. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna put the motion on the floor for the general report with understood Dunville is out, and then we'll look to see what happens if there's a motion after. So I have a motion that report number GM 042237 Grand River Conservation Authority hunting program review be received as information. Moved by Catherine, seconded by Jim. Any further discussion? Any opposed? That is received for information. Now, I understand Mr. Bernie would like to put forward something. I'm just guessing. <laughs> Yes, if I may, I would like to put uh, option three forward with one change, and that change is that it be an organized, uh, recognized group that would run the program. And if I get a second, I wish to speak on it. Okay. Can I, just for clarity, so uh, just so staff has this, you want to see, suggest we go to option three as long as it's an organized program, but are you going to have us look into it or just go right? To the, uh, well, let's see how the, the thing goes. Joe, I'm sorry. Is there a seconder for the motion? Seconded by Joe and Dan. Okay. So the motion on the floor is that we use option three. Can you, can you read back what you think we might have here, Karen? Uh, sure. Oops. Okay. Uh, designate full pheasant program to volunteer group by a third party agreement. Uh, so it would have to be with a, a legal entity. Presumably, I, I believe that's what you meant. Yeah. Right? Sure. So that's part of the motion, third party legal entity. Okay. Is that good? All right. And so Bernie's put that on the floor. Joe has seconded it. Discussion. Okay, so go ahead, Bernie. Yes, thank you very much. Speaking in favor of it, and I thank you for your indulgence. These hasn't, a pheasant hunting is a put and take thing. I was involved with the pheasant, pheasant program in Dunville. We understand that uh, only 6% of these pheasants survive. And I can tell you the majority of pheasants are taken by raptors. This is the information that was provided by me. The hunters who utilize uh, this would have to be members of the OFAH, which has along with it, uh, answers the question about liability. Members do have liability insurance and I understand the uh, deep pockets thing, but they do have to have liability insurance. Hunting, I don't want to get into the ethics of it. We spoke about it. It's, it's legal. This has been something that they have been participated in quite a while. We're saying that we don't want to put forward the resources to get involved with it. This shifts that responsibility to a, an organization, a responsible organization, and I frankly see no difficulty with uh, having the most pheasant hunt and deer hunt. Each has its own season. Thank you, sir. Uh, Joe? 
just uh, I'll just briefly add to uh, what Bernie has mentioned. Maybe a question to uh, staff. This uh, pheasant hunt has been uh, in existence, if I read correctly, 30 years. And I'm just wondering, in those 30 years, have there been any significant challenges, any significant issues, um, you know, that, that have been brought forward to G, you know, whether it's liability issues, uh, have there been anything at all that would um, suggest that uh, it's a dangerous to have the two types of hunting together? Is there anything at all that, you know, that we could look at that would make this uh, a difficult uh, uh, motion? Go ahead, Sam. Sure, you, Mr. Chair. I just want to clarify, the challenge is not necessarily the two types of huntings. It's that we would be giving exclusive use to a club to use a property, which then hampers our use of the property. So we'd have to talk with the lawyers about how we would make sure that we're still covering off our liability uh, in terms of owning the land and allowing this third party to conduct this volunteering thing. Usually, like, for example, Broad Creek, Broad Creek manages it in its entirety. So the challenge with the pheasant hunting is that it's the same property that we offer other programs to that we facilitate and whether or not that would then limit our ability to offer those other programs so that we can have the, the pheasant. So it's not necessarily a conflict in terms of there may be overlap for sure, um, which is a challenge. It's just that we're giving people the right to use our property for an exclusive use and then us coming in to use it for something else while it's under an agreement, we'd have to talk to the lawyers about how we manage that challenge. If I may, Chair. Please, yeah. Also, uh, we have had challenges over the years. And again, this is back to the staff and how, how what staff's role will be here in terms of priorities. And that's really what has changed here from the staffing perspective is that priorities um, have changed corporately. And so that's where they, we don't have the resources to manage it through staff. One additional thing I would just like to ask, offer, request is if this, uh, if this motion is going forward, if it could be that staff explore enter, entering into an agreement uh, rather than committing to, only because there may be some additional challenges that we are not fully aware of. Um, for instance, uh, you know, whether there's any permitting involved in terms of the, you know, keeping the, the stocked pheasants on our property, or um, if a, an external club is willing to bear the, the responsibility for all of the costs for the, the pens, the food, the birds themselves, etc. So just to really fully explore anything. Um, I, I, I just, if we get a motion that we have to enter into an agreement, but then if we're unable to, then I, I just, I'm concerned about some of the unforeseen challenges that we may encounter. And, and, and frankly, that's the point I was going to raise. And I'm just asking Bernie and Joe, I mean, the intent clear here clearly is to look at option number three. But I think just to make sure we're covering all our bases, because we are talking about volunteers and hunting and insurance and agree, a whole bunch of stuff here, would, it would be okay to, for the motion, the intent would be for staff to go back and see what it would take to implement option three and bring that back. If Is I that may, the intent? Does that work? If I may, I have no problem with that. I do know, and I shouldn't speak of Dunville, there's that arrangement with Dunville that they have with the uh, organization. Previously, anybody could utilize that property. So I see that type of arrangement coming here. And yes, I think you should cover your bases and uh, discuss that, and I'm hopefully it won't be lengthy and getting, and perhaps it can be dealt with at the uh, next meeting. But I will be supporting the objective. Okay, so if you're so, just so I'm clear here for the board, the idea here is that staff has made a recommendation to uh, continue the, the no kill the pheasant, uh, terminate the pheasant hunt, continue what we're doing currently. There's now a motion on to look at option three. And it's an intent to look at option three. It's not to implement option three until we know what option three actually looks like. We are going down a pretty significant road here. And from my personal perspective, if I was to vote either way, if you wanted option three, just as it is and up and voted and yes or no, I couldn't support it simply because I don't have enough information. 
there, there are some things here. We do have a fiduciary responsibility, a, a legal insurance, all of it. And, and we got residents and things all over the place. So I think if we accept that your motion is to have them look into three, bring back a report, and then the board can decide if we're going to proceed or not. I think that's the way to go. Are you, Joe and, and Bernie, comfortable with that motion, that idea? That works. Anybody, anybody else on the board have any comments on how we're doing this? I just want to make sure we're 100% clear. So there's a motion on the floor. Can we, look, can we just clarify and put it out how we're going to word this. So a recommendation is to look at option three, um, implementing option three and bring back a report, something that simple, which would then include what with, with an organized group and bring back a report. Can we amend the motion, something like that to make it simple and to the point or no? If everyone is in agreement with that as a friendly amendment, I'm fine with approaching it that way. Bernie and Joe, you all right with that? Okay. So, so the, the, um, so we have a motion on the floor. I'm going to ask for a post, but if things get weird with hands and stuff, I'm going to go to an, an official yes or no vote. So I'm clear. So motion on the floor, any opposed? One, two, three, four. Am I doing a count, Karen, or you? <laughs> I'm counting. I see four opposed. I, uh, I see four opposed. Okay. Uh, so uh, just to be clear, because of the nature of this, all in favor? I should have done that first. Uh, I'm losing it up here. Okay, so that's carried. And again, just to close this off, um, this is for staff to look into option three, bring back a report, and then the board can make a final decision on the pheasant hunt, and, and then we should be done with it. Fair enough? All right. Shall we move along to more exciting stuff? Uh, <laughs> watershed conditions. Dwight, do you have any comments to offer us today? Is he here? I'm sorry, I don't, I can't. Yeah. Yes, there um, you are, sir. Just a minor comment. Basically, we're in our filling cycle right now. Um, so, you know, we're, we're cautiously filling the reservoirs right now. The watershed is still very reactive. Uh, I think a lot of the land out there is still uh, saturated or wet, um, but we're in a normal operating range for this time of year. The other thing we'd note, um, is that groundwater levels did recover much better this year heading into the spring and summer period. Last spring, we had very little recharge in groundwater. So we're optimistic uh, with the numbers that we're seeing in, in the groundwater wells and that sort of thing. I'll take any questions for you, uh, Mr. Chair. Sure. I'm going to put the motion on the floor, then we'll look for questions. Motion that report number GM 04-2241, current watershed conditions as of April 13th, 2022. You received this information, moved by Les, seconded by Warren. Comments or questions? Bernie? He's on mute. You're on mute, Bernie. <laughs> uh, I apologize. Just a quick question. Is it me or do I see an enormous amount of wet days this year? You said it's regular. I don't recall seeing so much in terms of wet days and rain and as to when the, uh, when the ground is going to uh, dry up for the farmers to get out there. Through you, Mr. Chair, I would say that uh, in response to Bernie's comment, um, the spring drying of the lands is, is later this year. Um, and I would expect it's just been the weather systems that we have been seeing. There's been kind of a seesaw back and forth. We, winter doesn't want to seemingly release. So um, we have been getting a lot of Colorado lows lately. So the snow event that we had last week was really a Colorado low coming across the Great Lakes. And um, the jet stream is sitting over us. So we get these cold cycles that uh, bring colder air over us. And then when the jet stream moves a bit further north, we're into the warmer cycle. And it just hasn't um, moved further north. Um, and that's, we just haven't had the heat to, to dry out the, uh, the soil coupled with uh, just very regular uh, precipitation that, that has kept things wet. So. Your observation, I would say, is correct. Uh, spring has been later this year, um, and that's why 
the way I term it is the watershed is still very reactive because the ground uh, is wet. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of rainfall or melt to generate a response. And uh, that means we just have to be constantly operating the reservoirs as we're moving through the filling cycle and keeping a close eye on weather, which we do. Thanks, Dwight. Thanks. Brian? Uh, just a comment, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just for Bernie, there's an old proverb up here is that late Easter, late spring. Spring mm -hmm. will come when it's ready. Is that in the far Farmer's Almanac? Was that Benjamin Franklin? All right. Okay, uh, any further questions or comments? Uh, Bruce Whale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm getting better at finding that mute button. Well, Just a, a quick update, Dwight. We've had several flood warnings this spring. Has there been any significant damage along the the reser or the waterway, and maybe in particular uh, concerning Western Westmont Rose Citizens Group that were concerned about uh, ice in around the island and and uh, other other areas that normally have flooded? Have you seen much damage? Um. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, good question. We had a very favorable melt. We had a lot of ice in the river. We had a decent sized snowpack, but the melt was very gradual and without much rain. That allowed kind of, you know, we'd get a melt and then it would cool down and then we'd get another melt and it would cool down slow. So it slowly released the water that was stored in the snowpack to the river. It gave time for the ice in the river to kind of loosen up and, and degrade. And as a result of both those things, we avoided what could have been some nasty ice jam flooding because there was a lot of strong ice in the river. And because the milt was spread out, uh, we didn't see high flows. It was just, you know, you'd get a, a milt release and then it would freeze or hold back and slow down before the next milt release went on. As a result of that, we really didn't see any major flooding this spring, but uh, it really stemmed from just the way the milt occurred. And we were very fortunate with the way the milt occurred this year. All right, anything further? Any opposed? That's carried. And look, I missed something. I, I Bit negligent with regards to Pam's report. I should have thanked her very much for that hunting update. That's a, it was, we all know in the discussion, this is a very complicated business with a lot of pressures and stuff. And she's handled it very well and, and done a lot of good work in there. And with some of the expansions and stuff, it's an excellent report. And I should have commented at the time. And I'm not sure if she's still there. Maybe Sammy can pass that on. We, we do appreciate that is a very difficult task that she's going through there. And I think she did a fantastic job. So that's that. Um, so we're gonna move into a closed meeting, if I'm correct. I have a motion here that the general membership enter a closed meeting in accordance with the Municipal Act Section 239.2 for the following purposes, litigation or potential litigation. Can I get a mover, uh, Bernie? Seconded by Guy. Any opposed? Are we good to go, Eowyn? Yes, we are okay, back online. Thank you, thank you. So I have one motion coming out of closed motion that the minutes of the previous closed session be approved as circulated. Moved by Warren, seconded by Les. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you very much. I wanna thank you all for coming today. We will see you in May. Motion to adjourn. Oh, motion, to adjourn. Adjourn. motion to adjourn, moved by Jerry, seconded by Les. We are official now. Fine job. Happy Earth Day, everybody. All right, folks. See you soon. Yeah, keep your